Hello everyone, my name is Michael Reichel and I will present to you the article SSE and SSD Page Efficient Searchable Symmetric Encryption. This is joint work with Brice Minot, Pierre Alain Fouque, Raphael Bost, and Angel Bossuer. So now I want to quickly motivate how and why SSE is useful. So say you have information that you don't want anyone to have access to, say confidential messages, or you know information about the aliens that of course the public should not know about or you have information about the One Ring, and of course, Sauron should not access this information in order to avoid destruction of the world. Well, more concretely, we have information, so a bunch of documents, and each of those documents contain information about certain keywords, so here in blue, for example, messages, aliens, or the ring. And each of those keywords um, appear in certain documents, and these documents are identified by document identifiers. So now we want to outsource this private information and we can do so by using symmetric searchable encryption. For this, we have a setup phase. So here the client will generally encrypt the keyword identifier pairs and also the documents and then send encrypted versions of those with potentially additional information to the server. Then the server stores this and later on the client can, can query keywords um, and then the server can answer these queries. It's important to note though that we can't just send the keyword ring, for example, directly because everything is encrypted. So the server can't really search without additional information. And this additional information that is required to search certain keywords is a token. In this case, for example, the token ring will enable the server to output all the identifiers and then the server can send the encrypted identifiers that match the keyword ring to the client and then the client can of course decrypt all of these identifiers and then later on potentially retrieve all the matching documents from the server. For security we look at an, an, at an honest but curious adversary model so the server will try to learn as much information as possible about all of our data but we can assume that he adheres to all the protocols honestly. So in general, SSE is very efficient. We only use, at least in symmetric searchable encryption, symmetric primitives. Usually it's hash functions, PRFs, or symmetric encryption. And this, of course, is very fast. Though, in general, the cryptographic overhead is actually fairly low. But in order to still be competitive with databases that don't have any privacy guarantees, we actually need to look at memory accesses. And for this, of course, it's important to know how memory is actually built and what memory we're we using. So in general, there's two big types of memories, HDDs, so um, hard disk drives where locality matters and SSDs where page efficiency matters. So locality measures the number of read non-adjacent memory locations because HDDs can read very fast actually adjacent memory locations. So the higher this number, the slower the read will be. On the other hand, SSDs only care about the number of read pages per query. So pages will actually be a few kilobytes large, maybe four kilobytes, for example. And reading a single page is essentially as efficient as reading um, just a few bytes of information from a single page. So in general, you will read the entire page. And this is why for page efficiency, you only actually care about the number of pages you read. But if we look into the research progress of SSE, we actually find that page efficiency and SSD was actually not studied at all yet. So what happened was that in 2006, the first SSE scheme with good security guarantees and also good efficiency was constructed. Then a breakthrough work of Cash and Tesaro from 2014 they showed that it's actually impossible to have locality, read efficiency and storage efficiency constant at the same time. So as a consequence, we can never be as good as a database that has no security guarantees efficiency wise if we care about locality. So if we outsource our database on, um, on HDDs. Despite this result, there's a bunch of follow up works that try to construct SSE schemes that are as close to optimal as possible. So for example, in NS18, we have uh, log log locality and of one read and storage efficiency. So it's actually very close to optimal, but because Cache and Tessaro showed it's not possible, 
um, we can never hope for something better. And in this work, we actually inspect page efficiency. And we actually show that if you, con if you want to construct a page efficient scheme that also has perfect storage efficiency, so constant storage efficiency, it's actually possible. So um, there's no such lower bound, at least in the static case, um, for page efficient SSE schemes. And we named our scheme Tetis because it uses a max flow computation and Tetis in Greek mythology is the mother of all river gods. So as a recap, what we care about is page efficiency. We want to minimize page access per accesses per query. We care about storage efficiency. We want to minimize the server storage and we care about security. So we want to guarantee um, that there's as little leaked information as possible. In order to be a bit more concrete about the security guarantees that we have, I will quickly sketch the security model in static SSE schemes. So in general, we have an indistinguishability based security definition where the client interacts with the server and the server is the adversary. So again, it's honest, but curious. So in the beginning, the server will specify a database and then the client will um, set up the database using the SSE setup functionality and th then send the encrypted database to the client. Then the client will have to query by the adversary specified keywords. So he will send the query token to the server and then the server will answer with the response. And in the end, um, the server should not be able to distinguish this from a simulated version where the simulator only gets access to um, a certain leakage of the information that the adversary specifies. So for setup, the, the simulator only has access to the setup leakage and for um, the search functionality, so for queries, the, the simulator only has access to the query leakage. And in general, the setup functions are the size of the database for the setup leakage and the size of the uh, identifier set that you have to return. So the response set R in this case. Um, so the number of identifiers that match a certain keyword W. And also the search pattern usually. The, the search pattern is essentially um, notifying the simulator when a keyword was already queried so that he can requery the same keyword. Um, so yeah, this query, uh, this query leakage is usually important in order to still be able to construct efficient schemes. Um, but in, on the other hand, because of this static SSE uh, security definition, um, after an interaction with the server, the server can, or the adversary can only learn these leaked information, so the output of the, of the setup leakage and the query leakage from the interaction from the, with the client. Before I dive into all the technical details, I will quickly talk about our contribution. First of all, we define page efficiency and we show that it's actually a very good predictor for throughput of an SSE scheme if it's run on SSDs. Secondly, we define data independent packing, so DIP schemes, and uh, these are actually simple um, allocation schemes or packing schemes that um, that are purely combinatorical and from these schemes we can construct SSE schemes that retain the same efficiency measures. Um, and then lastly we define actually or we built an efficient DIP scheme based on cocoa hashing for weighted items so this not hasn't been done before so this is a new algorithm that allows us to use cocoa hashing so that allows us to do allocation essentially um, for weighted items. And this is based on a max flow computation. And also this is the main technical part of the paper. And then lastly, um, we use our framework that we defined before in order to construct an SSE scheme that has optimal page and storage efficiency based on Tetis. And yeah, this SSE scheme is also called Tetis. So now we'll dive into the technical part. And for this, first of all, I will introduce data independent packing. So for data independent packing, we have a multi-map, so keys that map to items. In total, we have n items and m buckets into which we want to uh, allocate our items. And each of those buckets have capacity p. 
and then for the for the worst case where one bucket is already filled up to capacity p but we still want to input items we have a stash where we can allocate items to as well so in general it's purely combinatorical which means that one key defines um, a bunch of buckets so in this case two and then we can allocate all the items to these two buckets and we cannot actually allocate any green items to other buckets than that and we do the same for um, the blue key and here again um, blue items can only be allocated to the blue buckets that I highlighted here and again we do the same for the red key and the same for the yellow key and because for example the capacity in this case might be five we can allocate the last item to the stash because the first two buckets are already full. Um, so more formally, we have a size function that returns, given the number n of items, the number of buckets m that we need in order to store all those items. We define this function in order to have the number of buckets be independent on the list distribution so that only the number of items actually defines how many buckets we want. Then we have a build function that takes a multi-map and returns buckets, so m buckets in total, that are filled with the items from the multi-map. And this also allows to return a stash s that has potentially items from the multi-map also. And then lastly, we have a lookup function. So for example, we can look up key 2, so the blue key. Um, and we also need to supply the number of items that the blue key uh, matches to. And then this will return the bucket indices. So in this case, the first two buckets. Um, yes, so this is essentially the IP. And we have three efficiency measures. So first of all, the lookup efficiency. Um, this returns the number of buckets per keyword. In our construction, this will always be two. Then we have the storage efficiency, meaning the overhead that I need to store n items. So I will need m times p space for my buckets. Um, and I only have n items. So m times p divided by n is the storage efficiency. And then lastly, I have the stash size. So the number of items that I didn't actually manage to allocate to the buckets. And by definition, DIP schemes are actually data independent, which means that they informally leak no information about the number of items that match other keys when we look up one key. And this is actually very important in order to construct SSE schemes from DIP schemes. So for this, we have the setup function. So the setup function takes as input the database, which itself maps keywords to identifier pairs. Um, then at first we choose two keys. So a key for an encryption scheme and a key for a PRF function. And then we use the PRF in order to map each keyword WI to a mask MI and a key KI. So we use the mask MI in order to encrypt LI. So LI is the list length um, of all the identifiers that match keyword WI, um, which we will later use for the lookup of a DIP scheme. And then um, we will store this in a map. So we map ki, the second output of the PRF, to this encrypted li in a table t. And then secondly, we use ki in order to replace wi in the database. And then the database essentially is already a multi-map um, that matches ki to the identifiers um, that match wi. And then we use the setup function of the DIP scheme in order to construct um, essentially a bunch of filled buckets with capacity p, where p is the page size, um, and also potentially the stash. And then in total, we define this, so the table t and the filled pages um, as the encrypted database. Uh, so first of all, we store the stash and, um, and the keys on the client and the encrypted database we will send to the server. And then the server st stores the encrypted database, so the table t and the filled pages. And then if the client wants to search a keyword WI, he will have to re-evaluate the PRF on the keyword WI. He gets the token. Um, so this essentially is the token TWI is the result of the PRF. And this is again, as before, the mask MI and the key KI. 
So the mask MI we can use directly in order to decrypt um, the LI, so the list length and the number of matching identifiers for WI. And then we can use the key also in order to look up um, using the DIP scheme, the matching buckets. And then if we have the matching buckets, we can just return the matching buckets to the client and then the client can decrypt those buckets and retrieve the items that he cares about. And here it's important to note that all the efficiency guarantees from the DIP scheme are inherited to the framework, so to this SSE scheme. So now I've shown you how to construct efficient SSE schemes from efficient DIP schemes. And all that is left is to construct an efficient DIP scheme. Um, I mean, this is easier said than done because this is actually the main technical content of the paper. So I will go through an example with you of uh, how Thetis works. So we have a bunch of items. So for example, five green items, two blue items, etc., And each color maps to one key. So these items we want to store in four buckets, each with capacity five. And how Tethys proceeds is that for each bucket, we draw four nodes in a graph. So bucket one will correspond to node one, etc. And then for each key, we will draw two random buckets. So in this case, we chose the buckets four and one, and we will draw five edges from bucket four to bucket one. The orientation of the edge is not important now. This will be optimized later. But what it means essentially is that um, each item corresponds to one edge and this edge is oriented outgoing from one bucket. So in, in this case, all edges are outgoing from bucket four and this bucket will later on be the bucket where we store the item. So now all items will be allocated to bucket four and we do this again for, uh, for the blue items. So we choose two random buckets, in this case one and two, and we draw two edges. Um, and now all the blue items will be stored to bucket one. And we do this for all the items. Now that we've drawn all the random buckets and allocated all the items to some buckets, this of course is not optimal yet. And for optimizing this, we pre-compute essentially the out degree of each bucket. So for example, bucket one has out degree six, which means there are six items that are stored in bucket one. And of course this is more than five. So we want to essentially out optimize this to be as close, the out degree to be as close as possible to the page size. For example, here the, uh, the out degree is three, so that means there's still space for two more items. Here the out degree is eight, so again over five, and here the out degree is already perfect, um, meaning it's five. So this bucket will store exactly the right amount of items. Um, so now, in order to optimize this, what we can do is we can just compute a path from a bucket that's overflowing, in this case four, to a path uh, to a bucket that is underflowing. And this means that if we reorient the edges, the out degree of the underflowing bucket will increase and the out degree of the overflowing bucket will decrease. And the buckets that are in the middle on the path actually don't change their out degree which means that we actually improve our allocation by one. Essentially, we have one less overflowing item. And if we repeat this, so for example, again, we have still seven items, so this is too much. Um, we find a path to two, which is the only underflowing bucket. We turn around the edges. So now there's no more path from an overflowing bucket to an underflowing bucket, which means that this solution is already optimal. And now based on this optimal graph, we can actually allocate our items into buckets. So again, we have four buckets and each edge corresponds to one item. So for example, we can choose this edge, which corresponds to this item. And since the edge is outgoing from one, we move it to bucket one. Again, this edge is outgoing from bucket four. So we move an item to bucket four and the other edges are also outgoing from bucket four. So we do the same for all the remaining green items. Now for the blue items, Again, we choose one edge, for example, this edge, it's outgoing from bucket two, so we move the item to bucket two. For the other edge, it's outgoing from bucket one, so we move the item to bucket one. Similar for the red item, we choose one edge, for example, the one outgoing from three, we move one item to bucket three, choose one other edge, which is outgoing from bucket four, so we move the item to bucket four. And for the last edge, 
we observe that we need to move it to bucket four by the graph, but the bucket four is already um, filled up completely up to capacity. So we can't actually move the item to the bucket. Um, but for this, we have the stash, so we can just move the item to the stash. And then we do the same for all the remaining items and we get this allocation based on the graph. And then we only have two items in the stash and all the other buckets are actually filled. And it's important to note that this solution is actually best among all these solutions, uh, no matter where you start from. So no matter the orientation in the beginning, no matter um, what choices you make during the algorithm, it always outputs a graph that later on leads to an allocation with the lowest stash size possible. So this is essentially how Tetris works. And then we show the main theorem of our paper, which states that there exists a valid assignment with overwhelming probability such that we can choose only m buckets, where m is equal to 2 plus epsilon times n over p, where epsilon is a small constant. So essentially n over p is the minimal amount of buckets that we would need for any packing algorithm, even if it's non-data independent. So the overhead is essentially 2 plus epsilon. And secondly, we show that the stash stress is only omega of log lambda divided by log n pages. And more importantly, this shows that the stash is independent on the size of the database, which um, is important because later on we will store the stash on the client. So uh, we would like this stash to not grow um, if we outsource more and more data. And on a more theoretical note, this is actually a direct generalization of cuckoo hashing in the static case. So in our case, we allow for weighted items, so lists of variable size. But if we choose only lists of the maximal size p, then actually this algorithm is equivalent to cuckoo hashing. And we show that even though we allow for variable sized lists, so not only the maximal size p, that uh, we have the same asymptotic behavior, so the same stash size and the same amount of buckets. So in conclusion, we show that um, cuckoo hashing works with stash for items of variable size. Secondly, we define data independent backing and actually construct an efficient DIP scheme. And based on that, we get an SSE scheme that has all of one storage and page efficiency, which is called Tetris. So before finishing my talk, I quickly wanted to show you the results of experiments that we ran. So in dark red, you can see the throughput and in bright red, in bright blue and in dark blue, you can see the inverse efficiency of page efficiency, read efficiency and storage efficiency respectively. And if we look at the graph, then we can see that the page efficiency is a very good predictor for the throughput. So whenever we have a very high page efficiency, we generally have a very high throughput as well. Secondly, we can see that Tetris actually has high storage efficiency, read efficiency and page efficiency. And it's the only scheme that comes close to a plain text database in all of these characteristics. And yeah, with that, I thank you for listening to this talk. And if you want any more information, then I invite you to read the ePrint article or to ask me questions in private.